So we are live finally. A very warm good evening to all. My name is Vartika Devedi. I'm the editor-in-chief of Services Reporter Magazine. 2020 marks the 10th year of the magazine and we are on the job to empower your ideas and creativity with knowledge that keeps you updated and informed about architecture and design sector. I'm extremely excited today to host the special guests uh, at Surfaces Reporter Magazine. None of them need any introduction. But to begin with, I wish to welcome the guest of honor, Ms. Montessor Moman Pampio, Deputy Ambassador, Embassy of Spain, New Delhi, uh, who will be sharing a brief welcome note for our esteemed speakers. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Rajendra Kumar, for organizing this webinar. And um, I would like to underline that Spain is uh, the third country in the World Heritage Ranking of Humanity after Italy and China. Uh, in Spain, uh, we have a, a, a witches uh, regarding artistic styles from Mudejar to uh, modernism. And uh, Spain is a very attractive country in order to go to study architecture. Uh, we have more than 84 universities, uh, 50 of them are public universities, and it's possible to study uh, these degrees in, in English. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we will ask you um, why to study in Spain. Uh, we have an amazing um, um, heritage, but at the same time, uh, our culture, uh, the Spanish language, uh, which is one of the mo uh, most spoken language, and at the same time, uh, the standard of living in Spain are very, uh, makes Spain very attractive to study in our country. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, recently, uh, last month, Spain has been awarded with uh, the prize of the best international heritage destination. And we are very proud of that. So uh, I encourage all of you to, to study in Spain, to, to promote uh, architecture in Spain, to come to our country to see our riches uh, regarding uh, architecture. And I hope that this webinar will be as much as fruitful possible. So uh, Marta, Hasif, all the best. And um, I hope that with this difficult situation, with the pandemic, uh, all after this situation will be uh, better than before. So all the best from the Embassy of Spain. Thank you. So Mr. Rajendra, uh, I would like you to, uh, you know, uh, thank ma'am and proceed further. Thank, thank you so much, ma'am. It has been really very kind of you that on a very short notice you could make it. I am really very grateful uh, for your gratitude for you. I am very sure that we are going to have much more collaborative academic and professional relations with the Ambassador in future. Uh, our legend architect Hafiz contractor, I mean, he doesn't need any introduction. He's a global architect, not only Indian architect. We do have a uh, lot of commonality between India and Spain. And I'm again, indeed, very, very grateful for you, ma'am. You, you could spare time with us. I know that you have another meeting lined up in the next five minutes. So you may not be able to be here. We will share the, the uh, video recording of the meeting. And on, if uh, architect Hafiz contractor permit me, I on behalf of architect Hafiz, I would really encourage uh, uh, Spain embassy, all the diplomat to visit any of the building of Hafiz contractor in in India, in uh, Middle East, or in any part of uh, Asia, and uh, uh, you will really see a lot of tradition and modernity combined together. So, architect Hafiz and Martha, I would like to just say that Madame has to leave. She has another uh, meeting very, very soon. If you just want to say, you have just uh, by note before we, we proceed. Martha, first you. Martha, you proceed. I mean, ma'am has to leave in a few minutes. Martha? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, 
Yeah, good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here. And um, thank you, Deputy Ambassador, for the kind words. As you know, I live in Madrid and I am um, the Dean of IE School of Architecture and Design. And I echo your kind words about the high quality of the built environment in Spain. And I also think we're at a very special moment because not only are we looking at the built environment, but the relationship to the natural environment and how we can make better use of our resources, protect them, because uh, not only our cities, but our hinterland are very much connected. Um, and of course, I've chosen to live in Spain, and I have to say, every day when I wake up, I'm very grateful to be here. And um, that's not to say that I don't love to travel, and um, it's been especially wonderful to visit India. And as you mentioned, uh, Deputy Ambassador, the connections between India and Spain are very good. And um, I hope that in the future, they'll become even stronger in the field of architecture and design. Thank you. Thank you. Architect of Peace. Uh, thank you, Madam. Thank you for all your good words. And uh, I really look forward to uh, meeting you when you are in Mumbai. And as far as Spain is concerned, it has always been a pleasure visiting any part of Spain. You know, uh, whenever I've been, and what you say, very, 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 very good. Have got some of the best heritage buildings and also a fantastic modern architecture. Nice meeting you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, so, thank you so much, ma'am. If you want to proceed, you can proceed. OK, so uh, now, before I proceed for the next part, I would just like to introduce my colleague, uh, Vartika Devedi, for uh, introducing all, all the art to eminent speaker. Just uh, before I proceed, I would like to read a, a small introduction about Vartika. Vartika is an editor-in-chief of Surface Reporter magazine. She has been doing a wonderful work in in the domain of architecture and design. She is a founder of the largest platform for women in design called Wade. She has been a speaker at many forums. She is also holder of Asia Book of Record. Passionate helping startup and female owned business to rise. Her profile is a synonym with her work as a great Asia for water and surface reporter. Uh, she has done extraordinary work in the field of women empowerment, architecture, and design promotion. So I request Vartika if you can introduce our speaker formally before we go for a uh, formal conversation between Afi and uh, Martha. Thank you so much, Architect Rajendra Kumar. I cannot uh, start the introduction without saying uh, two words about Architect Rajendra. A surfaces reporter and Architect Rajendra Kumar, who is actually the director of the School of Architecture. We have been doing extremely successful knowledge sessions together, and I always wait for these kind of sessions because so much of things I learn from these sessions and waiting so much to listen to the uh, you know, guests today. So architect Rajendra Kumar is the director of the School of Architecture, Noida International University. He has worked in so many countries. I cannot even take all the names, <laughs> Spain, Italy, China, UAE. And he has been a member of the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat in the USA. The architect, he has also worked in various eco-sensitive architectural projects and also delivered lectures on many national and international forums. Many of you may not know that he is also a very good photographer, very keen interest in how the cities are developing. And he is extremely passionate about knowledge sessions with wonderful people like you. So without much wait, I would like to give an introduction to two people of two people who need no introduction at all. So <laughs> starting with architect Hafiz contractor. Architect Hafiz Contractor is one of the most significant names in the realm of Indian architecture today, uh, in the global architecture, I should say, practicing since 1982. Today, Hafiz Contractor heads the largest architectural firm in India with over 550 team members and with over 
of 2,500 clients and 7.2 billion square foot of ongoing projects in 100 cities and five countries. He is the recipient of the highest civilian awards, uh, one of the highest civilian awards in India, the Padma Bhushan. He studied at Academy of Architecture in Mumbai and graduated from Columbia University, New York. He's also the winner of over 75 national and international awards for excellence in contribution to architecture. Uh, the list goes on and on. So <laughs> I would like uh, I would like to welcome architect Hafiz contractor to this forum. And so happy, so happy to meet you. And the other lady uh, who is sitting here, the wonderful and beautiful Martha Thorn. She is the Dean of I School of Architecture and Design. Since uh, 2005, she has served as the Executive Director of the uh, Pritzker Architectural Architecture Prize, uh, popularly known as the Nobel Prize for Architecture. Prior to joining the IA University, she was Associate Curator of the Department of Architecture at the Art Institute of Chicago. She is the co-author of the books Masterpieces of Chicago Architecture and Skyscrapers, The New Millennium, editor and author of the Pritzker Architecture Prize, The First 20 Years, and author of numerous articles for architectural journals and encyclopedias. She is an encyclopedia herself for architecture, education, design, and she she's a person who uh, her, her foresight for you know studies in architecture and design is something that I'm really looking forward to listen to today. So over to architect Rajendra Kumar to please proceed with the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vartika. Uh, such a word, such a nice to hear. Uh, a very good word by from your your mouth. I know we have been doing a lot of good initiative together, always for the profession of architecture. And I really thank uh, our legend architect of his contractor for for assisting this. And you have been a really inspiration for many of the people, not only in India but all over the world. And thank you so much, Martha. You have been always. I know we have been knowing each other from last couple of years, and we started our e year in this. 2020 in January when we met in Mumbai and that time architect of architect of yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, just to avoid the echo I would request everyone to pu um, put you there you can mute, or, uh, mute whenever they need to speak okay so uh, to have a conversation this evening we we have just chosen a few topics uh, where we will be having a deliberation and after that we will also open for all the public. So next 30 minutes, we are going to discuss are three very important core issues. The one issue which, which we know that its whole world is suffering or, you know, waiting, waiting to overcome from it about COVID and, you know, the pandemic and the cities afterward. And the second issue which we are going to discuss about architecture practice, we when we talk about architecture practice, who better than a fees contractor can tell issues about what are the challenges, how he come um, at this uh, level. Uh, just for uh, architect Hafiz contractor, for your information, we were just, you know, listing some of the questions by a different, different audience. So one of the very young audience, he has written a, a question, very, very cute question, which I really inspired is that how to become Hafiz contractor. So that was, uh, so that was such a great, uh, you know, aura of you, sir. I I personally have regard for you. You know it very well. I always look up to you. We everybody want to become Hafiz contractor in India. I would just like to share a one book here. You can see becoming Hafiz contractor. So this is uh, the book of uh, becoming Hafiz contractor. is a part of everybody's library in. In India, I believe Martha also, you also have uh, this book in your library. So everybody wants to become a fees contractor, of course. And Martha, I mean, she's such a wonderful lady. She is, she has been, you know, speaking all, all forum, promoting architecture, education, promoting also, um, rewarding uh, global fraternity of architecture, I mean, be it uh, Prisker Prize or, or be it 
whatever way writing. So uh, I'll go for the first part of our discussion. We, as we all know that uh, this year started with the, a slight ring of COVID, the corona. We, we could not even imagine that corona will last till, I mean, until and year. Still, there is a good news which are uh, which are coming that the vaccine may come in the beginning of next year. But still, the one year of loss in in the humanity uh, uh, in the human has happened. I would just re request both of our speaker to give a comment that where does architects play a role in the future of cities post COVID pandemic? So I'll request architect Hafiz to start. Then then we'll take to Martha. Please. Uh, thank you very much, Rajendra. Uh, and uh, it's nice uh, to, uh, to having a discussion with uh, you, Martha. Uh, uh, I, I'm not a teacher, but you know, I would like to say that uh, whatever I have been doing in my life, uh, uh, is, uh, when I started my practice, uh, whatever I did was for a reason. And so was, you know, like, you know, how I started the two feet, six inches architecture uh, in the early 80s. Then how, why I did, uh, uh, you know, the slum redevelopment project uh, that was also for a purpose. Now, when we are talking about, uh, <coughs> as the year started uh, in the first one or two months, I was really very confused and I did not know what was happening. I started reading about a lot about COVID. And finally, we came up uh, uh, and uh, when we are talking about COVID, uh, it is very important that we talk right now about climate change. And both of this put together uh, made me think and uh, I started analyzing a lot of things that we are doing and and how to go about. And Martha, you just said about uh, resources. Uh, so combining everything, uh, what I felt the time has come that we have to look at uh, how we are designing buildings. And one of the first thing that we started doing is how to take care of resources whatever we do uh, has to take care of uh, climate change and is it respecting climate change now at this time uh, what is very important unlike the uh, the global countries for india we have a fantastic we have a great population of 1.3 billion people so for us uh, a lot of things are much much more uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, resources, uh, what we are doing for, uh, 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 are going to be doing for our cities, how we are going to plan our new cities, how we are planning our existing cities. Uh, 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 though the Indian government is said that, you know, to have, you know, uh, smarter cities, is this the right way? Uh, to have more urban area added up to our existing uh, framework because uh, our, India is one of the countries uh, which has the maximum uh, uh, urban coverage. And from other side, uh, uh, our, uh, uh, you know, uh, the forest cover has to increase to come to uh, uh, the, the Paris Accord. Now, considering all of it, uh, we started first with, we changed the way buildings are going to be designed. So what we did, uh, whatever you could design uh, in say 100 square feet or a lack of square feet, if you could get uh, say 100 flats, we made a way by which we could do 110 flats. Same size, same everything. Uh, a better structure, cheaper structure, and economic use of the materials. So what we said, if we start doing that, uh, and if we have this theory that we can do 10% of the building in the same, or 10% of the function more in the same area, uh, 
offer with the same amount of uh, material, it will lead a long way in the future. As far as uh, the cities are concerned, uh, uh, I don't know whether you all are aware of what happened, you know, once the uh, lockdown started. Uh, uh, we have a migratory labor coming to most of our uh, metros and they live in slums. We had done a study for slum redevelopment and that became a policy. And in fact, because of that, uh, the, uh, the New York Times had covered me, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a great extent. But that for me was not enough. So I made a study by which not only I can house all of those slum people uh, into new housing. And further to that, uh, the most important thing is today, uh, that all of this migratory labor, they do not have a buying power uh, for a regular house, which is being given in our cities. Their buying power is only three to four lakhs of rupees to buy a house. So I have made a scheme for them to have a house in three to four lakhs. Now, with all of these kind of things, you know, today is not the forum to, uh, to show you how I have done a house in three to four lakh rupees. But uh, this is what we have come. And in fact, uh, uh, I'm saying that and, and, and uh, today we are much, much more busier than before uh, uh, with the kind of amount of work that we are having because we have completely revolutionized the way to do things uh, and uh, uh, developers and uh, other people are really interested and we are giving them that service. Now, I, uh, uh, if uh, with the, uh, further to what you would like to say, you know, I have to restrict myself to only some one or two minutes. So I hope I have not gone further. Thank, thank you so much, sir. We have been knowing that you are doing a lot of, uh, lot of things which are path breaking in in in, a, in mumbai and in many other cities of india which will be translated definitely to the globe also so i'll request martha if you can give your uh, comment about the same issues please yeah thank you so much and it's such a pleasure to be with uh, the the three of you it's really an honor um i i do think that architects and designers uh, have they always have had an important role to fulfill but as you say um, uh, in light of COVID, it's even more important. Um, I think they have architects uh, can help in reconfiguring our built environments and rethinking our cities. I, I think that they also have to be able to dialogue with our policymakers. And if I could say that maybe there are um, two or three areas that I hope uh, when I look at architects, and I hope they'll see the way forward. Um, one is understanding that buildings and urban spaces should not have just one function. We don't have the luxury of having one office building just for office workers, a home just for, for staying at home and, and having family life, a school just as a school, um, just as in the, in the, urban realm, our parks have to be able to accommodate um, uh, people who need to exercise or want to exercise, but maybe children. Um, and the reason I say this, we have found that it's very hard with COVID to work remotely from home. It's a stress on everyone who, who is, and, and many of us are fortunate to be able to work from home. Not everyone has that luxury. But I think we're realizing that our spaces need to be able to transform themselves and to do many functions. They also, our public spaces can transform themselves throughout different times of day. Maybe uh, in midday, they're a place where our senior citizens can gather safely. Maybe it's uh, in the late afternoon where children will play. And maybe in the evening, they become our terraces and our restaurants where we can have a meal together. And 
So I think that this is one aspect of COVID that I hope in the future, more of a flexible nature of our spaces, our functions for the cities will, will take place. The other, the other um, aspect I hope is we realign our priorities in favor of people. Um, and I can only speak from uh, a European or American perspective where much of our city are, is covered by streets for cars. Um, much of our city is not used for uh, pedestrians trying to get from one place to another or for bicycles or for other means of transportation. So I hope in the future, we try to create neighborhoods where we can meet most of our needs within a neighborhood. Um, some because we can walk close to the clinic or to the school, but other times maybe using technology to help us connect. So we won't need so many big streets or avenues to go from one point of the city to the other because we can have our needs met closer to home. But if we do have big cities, and I think of ones close to, to my own house, there are days of the week that they're closed to traffic. So Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays, they become places for bicycles, for sports, for children's playgrounds. And again, this understanding that because of COVID, what we've seen is that it affects each and every one of us this putting people, individuals at the center of our, of our policies and our design, understanding that we need to count on individuals to create healthy and safe environments. And of course, those individuals then form neighborhoods, communities, our cities, and finally our countries. So I, I do hope we learn some good lessons from COVID and I rely on architects and designers to take their place at the table to help implement them. Thank you so much, Martha. And that connects me to a, uh, a question to architect Hafiz. You mentioned about the role of architects for influencing policy maker and policy maker is, are the, the one who decide everything for the cities. And we, uh, we as a professional, we need to also have a, have a our voice very strongly together. Uh, uh, architect Hafiz, if you remember, we were having a discussion in when we visited New York last time about the importance of, you know, the voices like you, who, who as a, at least among the architect fraternity, one of the very strong voice in India. So I have a question for you about that. What do you advise to policymaker to solve issues of, uh, the issues what uh, Martha has discussed about neighborhood, uh, social housing and uh, let's say multi uh, multi functional of spaces maybe i mean this this word of multi multi function was existing before but after pandemic this has word this word has become even more relevant now so architect hafiz what do you advise for policy makers uh, see uh, before going to the policy maker uh, i would like to say that uh, the one thing which is really concerning today and which is the most important thing for India is to provide houses, uh, affordable houses to each and every Indian. Okay, Because if you look at it, 50% uh, of uh, the people in uh, Mumbai are staying in slums. Uh, every second person stays in a slum. Uh, every third person in Delhi stays in a slum. Every fourth person in Chennai stays in a slum. And every fifth person in uh, Calcutta stays in a slum. Now, uh, that is the most important thing to transform that. Uh, uh, then and then only we will have a better quality of life. So to do what, uh, to how to transform these people who are staying in slums into a pakka house. Uh, so that they have a better life. So now with that, uh, uh, what we are doing for the policymakers, uh, we have just gone uh, about, uh, you know, all, all these years we have been uh, uh, hearing about Dharavi. And Dharavi uh, was one slum which could not be transformed because it was never possible financially. 
So we did a completely a new scheme uh, just about a year back uh, and in the start of COVID. And we have shown it to the government that how we can make house all of these people, uh, that is 80,000 families uh, into a proper house with proper sanitation, proper and uh, and still uh, they, the city would make money because unless and until whatever we can talk about all the good things, okay, finally, everything will come to uh, whether it is financially possible. So we have made it that it is financially possible. The same thing we did uh, for another area also where uh, all the old shawls, uh, uh, they could not be uh, transformed. We did that and presented to the government and showed that, see, this is the right way to do it, uh, where people will get their houses and again, it will be financially possible. So I keep on doing this thing every second day. I have done a recent another study uh, uh, in which I went to the minister and showed uh, that all the slums of New Bombay uh, could be transformed uh, by uh, another idea. And he was thrilled to get that idea. And he said, uh, let's meet again and we take it forward. So I keep on doing that virtually every day. Uh, day uh, and whenever I get an opportunity to meeting any politician, I give him an idea and I say, sir, let's do like this. Let's do like this. Uh, uh, we we gave a, uh, uh, last year, we gave an idea uh, uh, to one of the large organizations, CITCO, uh, and by which uh, we are doing one lakh houses for the poor, uh, which uh, are now getting built. Uh, and it was, you know, I, 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 I created the land, I created the whole thing uh, and gave it to them and, and the guy took it. So, so, the, so this is what I do. Well, thank you so much, sir. I mean, we have been, I mean, we know what, what you, how you have transformed Mumbai and Gurgaon for that matter. Uh, Martha, you had been traveling all over the world, I mean, and you are um always you know interacting with a number of international architects uh, and seeing all the good work with your experiences like what uh, architect hafiz has mentioned about the transformation of slum and the the complicacy of slum in the cities how would you like to comment on the issues about another similar example in other country or maybe your whatever limited experiences of visiting to India. I believe that in India you visited Mumbai, Delhi, Ahmedabad, not much if I'm not wrong. Yeah. So any experiences of your, I mean, how about the issues of this slum housing and how the other architects are also uh, doing? I believe uh, listening from you, it will be very interesting uh, and for all the audiences. By the way, before you answer, I just want to make an announcement. We have almost like a 500 people on Facebook, same number almost on YouTube. So we have almost 1,000 plus people. I encourage everyone to type a question. We will take question in in last part of the session. So every audience, please type your question on YouTube or Facebook, please. So Martha, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. The, the, question, uh, the question about affordable housing or how do you uh, respond to slums, um, I, I think we have to remember the cu cultural context of different places. So there may not be the same answer in every place. The culture, the climate, the land, the finance is all different. And as architects, um, one of the great th strengths is understanding the context and the parameters. So that's that's the first thing. I, I think when when I look at slums around the world, it's now uh, about 25, 30% of the world's population is living in slums of some sort. This is a huge, huge amount. And so I think that we cannot imagine that in one short time frame any government is going to have the resources to build completely new houses to house everyone. Um, there's not the land, there's not the resources, and, and, and it would be very difficult to do that. So I think we need to think about what is, what is a house 
what are we what are the objectives of affordable housing and as architects do so well solve multiple problems at one time so clearly um, architect Haviz has talked about the need for safety for sanitation for a secure home where one feels safe and can live with their family I, I think in addition to that we also need so that the location has to be uh, where people can have a job. It also has to have education and some space around so people can develop their personal lives and the lives help their children with that. So uh, a housing is, is really not just shelter, it's really a package that allows people um, to meet their short-term needs in a healthy way, but also to, to grow uh, as people and grow economically and hopefully have more choice in the future. It also has to do with community. So I often speak of Alejandro Aravena. He had the idea of building half a house, knowing that funds are limited. Uh, the architects would give the structure, the electricity, the plumbing, the bare bones of the house. And for um, a small, for one half of what was the final goal. And then the families would work and build and, and do the finishes, the painting, the tiles, um, any sort of uh, additional uh, elements the house needed. And when they could earn a little money or when they could get together with their neighbors, they would build the other half. So this, this is one way of approaching it. In Brazil, in the favelas, in some favelas, they realize that the community is very strong. They realize that the people don't want to go to another place and be uprooted. And sometimes um, there is space but the structures may not be the best. The infrastructures are still um, not to the point that's needed. So rather than tearing down the slums and trying to relocate people, which takes time and lots of infrastructure and lots of funding, they try to consolidate and improve with the communities, finding out what is most needed, how can they improve what is existing. So I, I think there's different strategies in different places. And then if we look at the United States, affordable housing may mean something totally different. Um, and I think what it is, is trying to have many options for people. And I would hope that these options are not segregated options where you can only go one place to find what you want. But this is the whole idea of building communities is that we can um, come together as different people, but still um, we need each other at different points of our lives. And, and that's what living in a city is, is having different people come together um, and doing different jobs, working in different ways, but all together as a city, creating this economic vitality, innovation, education, and the cultures that unite us. Thank you so much, Martha. You very rightly said that every the whole world is having a, the slum issue. I remember when I was living in Madrid, the area called Nava Piers, you know, which is again, I mean, it's like Lava Piers, it's like a, a dhar, not exactly like a Dharavi of uh, Mumbai, but something similar. I mean, it's in the heart core of the city. Uh, and you also mentioned about the innovative uh, design of Alessandro Aravena, I mean, our Prisker. Uh, so then I will now I'll shift my uh, question to a little bit more toward about innovative practice and the uh, and the uh architecture prices like a prisker or all the other prices since you have been involved in in prisker um and you also mentioned about uh, the uh, the design of alessandro aravena uh before i go to uh, architect hafiz i would just like to ask you this thing that you know these architecture prices it could be anything about aie gold medal or aie uia architects prize and all 
how do you think about that these innovative architecture practices like um, you mentioned Ara Aravena, C Al Alvaro Siza, and we also have Indian architect Vivi Doshi, that how to have such kind of impact on globe, which is not only make you make architect financially successful, but at the impact globally, which architect Hafiz has done. I mean, his, his project of uh, Imperial Tower 2, I believe, Imperial Tower 2, we were, we were talking about the, the story of uh, the women, the, the Marathi women, they were doing a puja as, uh, of architect Hafiz contract, contractor when he was doing, he, he gave a shelter to, to them. So we will discuss about that thing later on. But how do you see about what is your message for global architects uh, to have an impact on globally, especially when we talk about the reward on internationally, like a Prisker and other architecture prizes. So be, I'll yeah. come to Hafiz in, in a while, but before that, I would like Martha to comment yeah. on it. Yeah, I, I think the, the whole area um, of prizes is, is one that's in evolution and it's one that we could debate a lot. Different prizes seek to do different things. Um, there are gold medals that seek to reward people within the profession and within the body of RIBA or AIA. So it's sort of rewarding themselves. I think um, the if we look at the Aga Khan Award, that looks to projects and it rewards not only the architects, but the clients, the community for a specific building or for a specific site. So that's a little different. I think in, in terms of the, the Pritzker, as you know, it has two goals, service to humanity and the art of architecture. And I think the Pritzker on one hand tries to inspire younger architects uh, and people who may want to go into the field. I think it tries to recognize this very, very difficult field of, of architecture. But, but I also think that it's trying to somehow find a balance between the service to humanity, which is, uh, which is a very big mission of, of any architect and it's done in different ways. How do you balance service with forwarding the discipline of architecture? And it's not easy and there is sometimes conflict in this area. So um, when it comes to prizes, um, I hope they continue to evolve because I think the way architects practice is changing. Um, I think that the idea of the old master who is, uh, has the truth is, is no longer correct. I think there are many truths in the world and there are many, many talented architects who may never win a prize, but thank, thank goodness for them. And just one little anecdote. I, I had a question from a student uh, uh, in an interview a few months ago, and they said, um, what should I do? I'd really like to win the Pritzker Prize. And I said to them, that's a bad goal to have. That's a bad goal. You should want to be the best architect you can to contribute the most to society in the way that you feel that you can, and the rest will come along on its own. So but that's sort of my thoughts in a nutshell. Architect Hafiz, contractor, if you can just give your, uh, you have you have received award for, from all over the world, but what do you think about the importance of prices? And uh, how I, 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 I think, you know, uh, uh, the way I practice, you know, what Martha just said that uh, it should be, you know, I, I feel that, you know, I, I'm working for people. I'm one architect uh, who does not, uh, uh, you know, say that, oh, this is the kind of a job I should take uh, and this is the kind of job that sh I should not take, okay? Anybody who comes to my office and says, oh, I would like you to do this work for me, I take that job. I'll just like to tell you one incident. Once a lady came and she said that, you know, she's coming from the government of Maharashtra and this is this, this. And she started telling me, oh, Mr. Contractor, you're a very big architect and you will not take this assignment, but just do me a BOQ. 
So I said, what, uh, why you want me to do that? She wanted to build a school for one lakh rupees. One lakh. One lakh ten thousand. Sorry. I, I reduced the budget. Sorry. One lakh ten. And uh, yeah, I said, what do you do in one lakh ten? And she said that, oh, I want to make just a ten feet by ten feet room. And every student, once he finishes with his class, will put the, uh, his uh, slate and pencil in it and go home. I said, this is not the right way to do it. And we designed the whole school with four classrooms, two toilets, a compound and everything in a village in only mud and uh, uh, rabbit. That is, you know, all the you know, old stone and everything in a village. And we made a school like that. And uh, she was very, very happy and it was going to be constructed. But unfortunately, she got transferred uh, into a diff different department. So what I'm trying to say that uh, to do a give a service to people uh, and uh, not select a job that, oh, this is a, a, a museum and I will make a great architecture out of it, okay, uh, and, and everyone will know me about it, okay. That is not what really, according to me, is architecture. Architecture is, as an architect, you are supposed to know the business, you are supposed to know the construction methodology and everything and do the right thing in the cheap, uh, cheapest way uh, and the best way. When I say cheapest way, does not mean that it is cheap, okay? The right way uh, and make that person happy. And that is what really an architect is. And what Rajendra was just saying about those two ladies, uh, it was when I did the slum redevelopment project for them uh, and when the Bhumi Puja was there, the inauguration was there, the ladies came to do an arti. That is, arti is, you know, like, you know, they do it only for God and their husband. So when I said, or when the guy said that, you know, oh, you know what they're doing. So I asked the lady, why are you doing that? And that lady said, that, do you know what you have done to us? You have changed our life. Today, we cannot go to toilet after sunrise. And we cannot go to toilet before sunset. You will be giving us a toilet in our own house. You have changed our life. Can you imagine uh, that if you cannot go to toilet for 15 minutes, what happens to your body? These ladies were controlling it for the whole day. So I feel I get a Pitsko prize virtually every day when a client comes to me and appreciates her. Uh, and that is what is my prize. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. I mean, I really, I mean, you, listening to you is always, uh, always very encouraging and seeing your work. I mean, uh, I, I'll just like to ask maybe because we have like so many questions by many young audience and many, but before we, we open it for q and I would like to just, you know, have a, some comment on you for young architects, as Martha has said that one young student came to him. And he said that he want to be a Prisca laureate, how to go ahead. And uh, I have my personal story when I, visit, I, when I entered in architecture school. My senior, they said that, do you want to become a fees contractor? Yes. Everybody want to become a fees contractor in India, mind you, sir. I mean, that's, that is. Uh, so what is your advice for young generation and your uh, comment about present architecture education. So I'd like to take a comment by uh, Marta and architect of his contractor very briefly on this. And after that, we will open it for Q&A. Vartika, you please be ready. We will open up Q&A. Please. Uh, Marta first. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think architecture education is. I'm sorry, it's architecture education is changing and evolving. And if I had to recommend things uh, to students, I, I would say that remember that architecture is not just an art, it's not just science or just technology, but it is that and much more. And so you need to be able to look at very complex issues 
And I think the way into the future of doing this is through collaboration, being able to speak not only with your colleagues within the School of Architecture and Design, but being open to other disciplines and what they can contribute. Um, uh, architect contractor talked about being able to speak to clients. He talked about speaking to politicians, speaking to developers. So you need to know the language of politics, of sociology, psychology, also economics to be able to be effective. Um, so I, I, that's basically what, what I would say in, in just a few words. So architect, a fee for your suggestions and your advice to young architects and architecture education per se? Uh, whenever I talk to uh, young uh, students who want to join architecture, I, I tell them that uh, architecture is one profession where uh, if you are not cut for it, uh, it might become one of the most difficult profession. And if you are cut for it, it is one of the most beautiful and the easiest profession. So, uh, as Martha put it in a different way, that, uh, so I'll put it in a very different way, that uh, you should be really, uh, whatever you do, uh, whether you take up architecture or, or any other profession, uh, there are lots of kids in, uh, India that somebody has advised them that oh uh, you will make a lot of money in this profession uh, and uh, if you get into that uh, I think that's a very wrong thing uh, you should feel uh, you should be happy uh, designing you know creating something and if you have the flair for it uh, then uh, it's like uh, for me uh, going to you know I start my day uh, sometimes at you know uh, five o'clock in the morning and end at you know very very late but i feel that i'm playing a game of golf uh, and i enjoy the whole day because i'm not working i'm just playing so that is what you know you should be and uh, uh, if you are interested in that and i always say that you know let's be the best uh, in any profession be the best barber uh, but don't be uh, a lousy architect or a lousy doctor so whatever you want to do and you feel that you are in it do that uh, but be the best thank you so much sir i mean you have been always a source of inspiration for many i mean i will again you know take a liberty and tell all the young architect to read becoming a fees contractor this this is a very good story about how hafiz is now today um before we go i mean uh, for closing i will request vartika if you can uh, moderate the session of live question answer vartika can you hear us sure, sure i can hear you um i'll do one thing because uh, it seems i am facing some issues so i'll just send these questions to uh, on your whatsapp also architect rajendra in case uh, uh, you know, the connection goes off or something, please carry forward. So I've got a lot of questions, a lot of questions. I've selected some of them. Okay. So uh, one uh, I will start with is, yes, I will start with is one of the fans of architect uh, Hafiz contractor. His name is Raghav Joshi. I'm sure he must be watching this. So he's from Bangalore. He says, I always wanted to ask Hafiz contractor about his early days as a young architect living and working in one of the prominent cities of the world how he paved his way through it <laughs> such a long question and how he shaped bombay as we see it today it's always been my dream uh, dream for me to seek guidance under him and to know okay so it's a long question i'll just cut it short for architect contractor uh, ragam joshi from bangalore wants to know uh, <laughs> how it has been for you as a young architect Number one and number two, which is a very, uh, I'm sure it needs a long answer and you've already answered a lot to it. How you shaped Bombay as we just see it today as the Mumbai of India. Sir, sir you need to unmute your Okay, sorry. Okay. I, I don't know how to answer, answer it in one of the lines. Yes. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I started... Uh, uh, 
my career uh, before I joined college. So uh, it was, uh, uh, and I used to come to office uh, at six, six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning. Then I used to go to uh, morning college by seven, then be in the office by 10. And uh, what uh, really uh, helped me or whatever I'm doing today is all the incidences which as a student, when I was standing behind my boss and uh, the way he used to talk uh, and how we used to deal with clients, all of that really made me what I am today. And I always conveyed, you know, uh, uh, about the story about a lady who came uh, from uh, Pune and she wanted us to design a house. And my boss wanted to, the house to be designed in a particular manner. And after two turns, she left because she wanted the house in a different manner. And at that time, I had asked my boss, why aren't we doing uh, the way she wants? And she says, uh, and he said that, no, that is not what, according to him, the architecture was. But I said, we are working for people and we have to make the people happy the way her. So, so my approach to architecture is completely different than a lot of other architects. A lot of, when I did the work for uh, Infosys, the Global Educational Center, one of my friends, uh, 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 he called me up and he criticized that, oh, what the hell have you done? And I said, no, my client is really happy. Uh, and Mr. Narayan Murthy today also takes everyone to sh show that building. So I feel what I'm doing for people is more important than making my fraternity happy. So that's the difference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The next question is for Martha, Miss Thorn. So we, uh, many of you may not be knowing that uh, she is an excellent speaker and she has delivered an excellent speech on creating a livable city, a TED talk, in fact. So uh, during this time of this pandemic, uh, when most of the cities are actually trying to find ways for making them more livable, I want to know from Miss Thorn, like, what is your message for the cities, a general message that you really want to give to the cities at this time? Um, I, I think that the message that I have is, is again, going back to using our spaces in more than one way. I, I think that would be thing, taking full advantage. We don't need empty office buildings, so maybe we can reuse them for other purposes. But I think the second message I would have for cities is it never before in the history of our lives have we seen so clearly how individual behavior affects the whole group and how we need every individual to understand what it is to try to keep their families, their neighbors, their communities safe. So because we have this understanding of the connection between the individual and the whole city, I, I would hope that cities would be able to harness that and, and find a way to let people know that they are also important in, in, in normal times. Not when we have a crisis, but they're also important on a day-to-day -day basis. What um, architect contractor said, when it comes to global warming, when it comes to making their neighborhoods better places. So it, it's in some ways being able to communicate messages that resonate with individuals and also giving them the space where they have power to affect change in their own environment. I guess I would say it's the demo democratic uh, process put to work related to our physical environment thank you so much awesome awesome answer so i was going through one of your interviews um and uh, there you talked about why architects need to think beyond building design and instead foster an entrepreneurial spirit to innovate in the built environment 
Uh, would you please elaborate a little about it? Yes, I, I think that this old metal old model of practicing architecture is not going to work in the future. It may work for uh, architects of the uh, reputation and experience of a carpet uh, contractor, but young architects starting out can't expect clients to knock on their door right away. They can't expect to win competitions. Um, and, and sometimes being an architect as architect contractor will tell us can be very lonely. So I think that there are so many important challenges facing society. Uh, architects and designers have a toolkit which is very special and they may have to figure out what is needed before having the client. And nowadays there are possibilities of crowdfunding, of, um, of getting your message out through the internet and other ways and having a great idea and then promoting it. So there's so much that needs to be done. I think that we need different models of, of architecture or design firms. And some of those will be self-initiated ideas that they will then be uh, sold or they will be offered to cities, to communities, to clients, or maybe they'll be uh, funded through venture capitalists in other ways. And so I think that uh, I think that that's one way that uh, we can change or we can expand the model of architectural practice. Vartika, may I ask a question? Let me uh, I mean, let me be an audience. I can also put a question. Uh, Please. I was just uh, my question is also uh, the question which is uh, one of the one of the audience has mentioned about Rajesh Agarwal. Uh, he has a question which uh, about that the architect Hafiz has discussed about improving the slum uh, conditions and making, I mean, uh, making a, a building which is mainly a high rise. So who do you see that the people who were living in slum and they are going to a custom of living in high rise building? I believe this is the question by Rajesh Agarwal. Uh, sir, if you will, I do also have a comment on that, but sir, how would you like to react on this question about the slum people going to live in high rise buildings, sir? Uh, that's one question uh, that has been uh, going on for a long, long time and before uh, even the slum redevelopment policy was started. Uh, a lot of people were saying that, oh, you should allow them to uh, do up their own slums and so many ways of doing things. But finally, uh, what a person really needs is a proper house uh, where he has uh, water uh, for 24 hours or if not for 24 hours, at least 12 or 13 hours. Uh, where he can have his own toilet, where he can have his own kitchen, uh, where in monsoon the roof is not leaking uh, and he can have a proper bed. Mind you, when we first did the first slum redevelopment scheme, uh, everyone, uh, uh, and, and th this is with uh, talking to all the slum guys, and they are not uh, thrown out from uh, where they used to be to some other place. They were housed at the same place. So everybody started saying that, oh, we would like to be in a house which is ground plus six upper only. We did those uh, ground plus six upper. And mind you, uh, uh, just two years later, everybody said that, oh, they would like to be uh, in ground and 14 or ground and 20 because they would like to have more open space uh, and in a city like Mumbai, uh, which is so short of space, uh, this is very well appreciated. And today uh, we are doing 
her slum redevelopment, which is 35 and 40 uh, floors. Now, look at it from a different perspective. One is from the city perspective that you have more open space for where the kids and everybody plays, but you have buildings much, much far off. And anybody who was living in a slum uh, and he gets this slum building, okay, when he is in a ground in 20 or 25 or 30, uh, when he gives that house to uh, his son or his, you know, heir, that person also thinks about it in a, like a property and uh, a high up, uh, the property values are also better. So even today, the slum guys really want to be high up and that is what the demand is. And it's good for everyone. It's the, the only thing it is not good for is the developer because he has to spend more money. But he is already putting the money in endowment for its maintenance. So you get much, much more better open spaces. So I also would like uh, that the slum buildings uh, uh, should go high so that you have more open space. There is an open air park uh, and you don't look into each other. I hope I answered my question. Sir, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. I believe that that's that is the reason why New York Times says the man who draws India, Hafiz contractor. <laughs> and we are really proud of it, sir. I mean, you have really drawn India, sir. Uh, I will request Vartika to take the last question before we go for closing. Yes, there's so many questions. Uh, so many questions. Um, I'll pick this one. From Bhavika, yeah, uh, she's asking, how do you push and motivate yourself during the not so inspiring days? I think uh, this question should go to both of you. No, what is the question? The question is about how do you keep yourself motivated? How do you keep yourself? How do you push yourself when uh, the days are not so inspiring, not so good? How do you do it? Martha, would you like to answer it first? Thank you. I, I would say that um, there are many days when one doesn't feel motivated, and especially now with COVID, there's a lot of pressure. Um, I think uh, what I do is I realize that it's not a weakness to ask for help. And so I try to reach out to friends and colleagues on those days, even though sometimes it's hard to do that. But um, I think feeling that you're part of a community, that you're not alone, and that um, other people share the, the same uh, worries and concerns and um, difficult moments, I, I think is, uh, is probably, uh, probably one thing. Then everybody has their own, their own ways. You know, some people like to put on music really loud, some people dance, some people eat some people do other things but i would say in my case um i rely on i rely on my friends and, and colleagues and they're extremely generous so it usually works thank you thank you okay uh i always you know whenever there is uh, i'm down and uh, out I look at uh, what are the problems like, and uh, I get to it and try and solve those problems. And uh, I, I can tell you that whenever I look at any problem, or sometimes when uh, the worst day is that the client is not happy with you, uh, and that's my worst day, uh, because and, and, and I get to it and I say, why is he not happy? what is the reason and i try and solve that uh, and when i solve that uh, uh, I, i'm the most happy and you know i, I keep on uh, in my mind and i try and solve what is the most genuine problem to me to the uh, people to the people surrounding or to one of my client and i just call him up and i say hi i think this is the problem let's solve it like this and we have come up with some real good uh, answers and that is the real pleasure uh, so that it's like nobody has asked you to do it but you did it and and i i find great pleasure in that awesome so being in action makes you keeps you motivated 
and like Miss Horn is said, like you know, she doesn't. We should not think before asking for help because asking for help is something that can bring people closer to us. Thank you so much. So over to you, Architect Rajendra Kumar. Please. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Vartika, and I'm so sorry, Architect Hafiz and Martha. We we crossed a 10 minute more. I know that you had a very busy schedule. Um, uh, what could be? I mean, how our and and has has come to end at least in India with inspiring word by Architect Hafiz contractor. If I summarize this, client is happy, then I am also happy, and I'm really very very. <laughs> This is the mantra for all the architects, not only in India, but all over India. I, You had been my ideal. You had been my mentor. Uh, I remember once you were talking about uh, that you don't have any architecture style uh, like others, but you have the style of, you know, making my client happy. I believe architect's role is such a very important when you are making the, the people happy. And in that way, why... Uh, architect uh, Hafiz contractor is successful. I believe all the young architects who who are listening to us, they are really very inspired. And I'm hearing a lot. I'm reading a lot of messages by number of uh, uh, architect. Architect Ashok Goyal, he has mentioned uh, that very inspiring word by architect Hafiz contractor. is always uh, great to listen to him. Architect Martha, she is such a wonderful lady. I, I, have, I have been knowing in my... 30 year of professional career, you had been always a, such a humble lady, which which uh, you, you will always keep on inspiring young, young generation and future architects. We look forward to you to welcome you in India sometime. And uh, as architect, architect Hafiz, we have discussed in uh, this thing. Next time, whenever you come, you please have a one or two days in your hand. We would really love to host you our Indian hospitality, be it Mumbai or be it India. Thank you so much, Vartika and your team. Uh, there are people who are behind the camera. Thank you so much, Udu and her team. And uh, thank you so much, Teresa from IE School of Architecture in Madrid. All the people in the screen of the screen, thank you so much. It was such a wonderful evening in India and such a wonderful afternoon in, in Madrid. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay.